Our first scripture lesson for today comes to us from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 1 through 8. This is our continuation of our five-part series exploring 1 Thessalonians. Let us hear God's word to us. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives us his Holy Spirit. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is a continuation of 1 Thessalonians 4 in verses 9 through 18. Let us again hear God's word to us. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you may behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Here ends the reading of God's holy word to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Gracious Lord, prepare our hearts now to hear your voice to us and no other. May your Holy Spirit quicken these words and make them alive that we might be prepared for your coming in our world. That we might also live a life that is pleasing to you. That we might walk with you closely. We pray this in Jesus our Savior. Amen. Verses 1 through 8. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, sexual immorality is certainly not the only sin that matters to the Christian faith or to the church. But because of the incredibly perverted Roman culture that Paul and the other apostles had to contend with, he had to help these new Christian converts see the difference between behaving like a heathen versus a Christian. And one of the most profound principles is not to defraud your neighbor not even to sexually defraud your neighbor. You see, immorality hurts not only yourself, but someone else. It cheats or defrauds 
someone if it's outside of marriage. And if we really love individuals, we really love people, we will not hurt another person. We will not hurt another husband or wife or children or family or our church family for that matter. And now in Rome, there were such awful sexual norms of behavior that I really can't express some of them to you in details. But the following summary of three immoral behaviors were typical of Roman sexuality. Number one, the pursuit of beauty and the obsession with the ideal masculine body. And it led to the widespread practice of pederasty, a sexual relationship between an adult man and an adolescent boy. This had been a common feature of the Greek world and was adapted by the Romans who saw it as a natural expression of male privilege and domination. Roman sexuality was tied to the ideas of masculinity, male domination and power and the adoption of the Greek pursuit of beauty. In the Roman mind, it, the strong took what they wanted to take. It was socially acceptable as far as a strong Roman male taking someone below his cultural status to have sexual relations with men or women alike. And there was no talk of orientation provided that he was the aggressor. Number two, women were held to a very different sexual standard than men where men were free to carry on homosexual affairs and to commit adultery with slaves and prostitutes and concubines. A woman caught in adultery could be charged with a crime. The legal penalty for adultery allowed the husband to rape the male offender and then, if he desired, to kill his wife. Under Augustus, it became illegal for a man to forgive his wife. He was forced to divorce her. Women usually married early and bore children and were never promised marital bliss but usually an uninterrupted string of children until they could either no longer bear them or perhaps died in the process. And so there were many unwanted newborn infants who were cast into the city dump. And some of the Christian families of Rome would secretly go out at night and rescue these abandoned babies and then raise them as their own. And of course, some of these abandoned infants didn't make it despite all their efforts and they were respectfully were buried in the catacombs of Rome. And you can still see some of those little niches in those tombs along the walls. They were named differently than their infant children naturally born. You see, women and children were much more highly valued in the Christian faith and in the Christian church than in Roman culture. Christian sexual ethics limited sex to a married man and his wife. It protected the children and it gave them dignity. A Roman woman was accustomed to being treated as a second-class human being. In Christendom, a woman found a culture of genuine love that saw her as equally important to any man in the sight of God. She was sexually equal also with a man in the marriage union and had equal recourse under the law of God and the church to demand marital fidelity. And number three, generally speaking, Romans were a people of extreme promiscuity and debauchery. And they who had power, the, the male citizens, were able to express their power through their sexuality by taking who and what they wanted. Their culture's brand of sexual morality was exemplified by their Caesars, who one after the other were living icons of immorality and cruelty, using their power and sex as a means of domination and self-gratification. And yet this system was accepted and even celebrated in Rome as a gift. And so to be a good Roman citizen, a man needed to participate in it, not to lead protests against it, to be loyal to Rome, a man also had to be loyal to the morality of Rome. And you can imagine how converted Christian men were ostracized 
when they spoke out against immorality and didn't participate in it. To the Romans, the biblical view would have been seen as disruptive to the social fabric and meaning of the Roman ideals. But Paul doesn't speak against these things just because of his personal opinion or his Jewish background. He says, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. It was clear that Jesus taught Judeo-Christian principles and high moral standards. And if we want to be close to God today and we want to be Jesus' disciples, we need to learn, as Paul said, how to possess our vessels in honor to God. Brothers and sisters, whatever else you know about the Bible, I'm sure you know this. It lays out a sexual ethic that displays God's high standards and challenges humanity to live in ways that are consistent with them. And yet they're beautiful standards that give us dignity. Today we experience a total sexual revolution that differs greatly from Judeo-Christian values. We have a society, I think, deliberately throwing off the Christian sexual ethic. Things that were once forbidden in the church are now celebrated as gifts, just like in ancient Rome. Things that were once considered unthinkable are now celebrated among the people that it's natural and good and simply the way that God made us. Now I want to call your attention to verse 8 and read those words. That he who rejects Christian morality is not rejecting man, but the God who gave his Holy Spirit to us. Friends, this is hardly the first time in our culture that Christians have been asked by God to live out a different sexual ethic than the world around them. In fact, the church was birthed and the gospel was proclaimed in a world utterly opposed to Christian morality. Almost all the New Testament texts dealing with sexuality were written to Christians living in predominantly immoral Roman cities. This Christian ethic did not come to a society that only needed a, a slight readjustment or to people eager to hear its message. No, not at all. The Christian ethic collided head on with Roman sexual morality and yet it was not compromised as it is today in the churches. Verses 9 through 12. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. The Roman world, unfortunately, did not see Christians as harmless, loving people who attended to their own business. Neither did they appreciate the Jews and all their laws and principles. Christians were outsiders. They were traitors. Christians were dangerous. Their brand of morality and beliefs threatened to destabilize all of society. No wonder then that they were scorned and ridiculed and persecuted. It is interesting to me that in 49 AD, the emperor then Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. That's in Acts 18.2. But according to the Roman historian Tacitus, that was because the Jews were always arguing and fighting among themselves, not with the Christians, about a person named Christos. Christos, an early reference to Christ outside the Bible. Later in 54 AD, Nero came to power at age 17. And Paul appealed to the emperor in 57 AD at age 20. That was Nero. Nero later became a brutal psychopath and blamed Christians for the great fire of Rome in 64 AD. And both Paul and Peter were executed by Nero shortly after the outbreak 
of the Romano-Jewish War in 66 AD. So the peaceful Christians seem to be like sheep to be slaughtered. And yet their love for one another and their intense compassion for other people eventually prevailed. I think it changed the entire Roman world and beyond, one person at a time. Verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. How interesting. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now everyone is certainly welcome to his or her opinion concerning these verses. And I know some of you have been waiting to hear some kind of commentary on them. But I would like to offer you the support of an ancient Christian understanding that is much older than our modern views. In Paul's day, we just don't see any evidence of believers believing in a rapture except at the moment of the return of Jesus Christ. They did not interpret the scriptures to indicate that the rapture of the church happens and it's a mystery before Christ's return. And then the tribulation comes for seven years and then another rapture comes when Christ returns. That is nowhere explicitly taught in the Bible. Find it. Christ is not coming halfway and fully again later. He is just coming one more time. Paul said that he was quoting the word of the Lord when he wrote. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until when? The coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. And with what? The trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is no mystery. And then we who are alive and remain until when? The coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But remember, he's coming with us and with those who have fallen asleep. This is the rapture taught in the Bible. And it occurs when Christ returns, period, with a shout. The word here used in the Greek is keleuma. It does not occur elsewhere in the New Testament. It means a cry of excitement, an outcry of incitement, clamor or shout, as if sailors are at the uh, oars fighting for their lives, soldiers rushing to battle. With the voice of the archangel, the word archangel occurs nowhere else in the New Testament except in Jude 9 when it is applied to Michael. It properly means a chief angel, one who is first or one who is over others, archon, and with the trumpet of God. The trumpet which God appoints to be sounded only on the solemn occasion of his return. Now compare these verses with Matthew 24, 31 and Matthew 24, 36 through 41 and you will find that they're all describing the very same event, the second advent of Jesus Christ. The event was known in the Old Testament as the day of the Lord. Paul's teachings parallel Matthew and Luke regarding the time of the day of the Lord or Christ's return. Now as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. You see, the context of this description of the rapture 
in Thessalonians is Paul's teaching about the second return of Jesus Christ. When Thessalonians mentions being caught up in the air, it's in the context of the phrase, the day of the Lord. And always, 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 mark it down, always, no exceptions, the Old and New Testaments describe the Lord's return and or the final judgment of God to be the day of the Lord. And that's what Paul, that's what Paul is referring to. Isaiah 13, 9. Let us look at some of these texts. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. Ezekiel 30, verse 3. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord, it is near. It will be a day of clouds. Remember, how interesting. Time of doom for the nations. Joel 2, 1 and following. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That's what Jesus taught. The New Testament, therefore, agrees with what the day of the Lord means. You can hear it in 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. That's not the tribulation. That's the return of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Obviously, the rapture. But the mystery is not how or when this happens. It is when at the last trumpet. Read it. For the trumpet will sound and the what? Dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. That's the mystery. How we can be changed and not go through death. The dead raised and the last trumpet, friends, only occurs at the return of Jesus Christ. The early church felt that Christ could return at any moment. Why? Because they thought with good reasons, I think, that they were perhaps already going through the Great Tribulation. And notice that they were not looking for some rapture other than Christ's return. They were looking for his arrival because immediately after the tribulation, as Jesus taught in the Gospels, he promised he would return again. So they thought if we're in the tribulation immediately after that, Christ is coming. Erwin W. Lutzer said many Christians long for the rapture not because of their intense love of the Lord, but because it symbolizes an escape from the distress of our age. If you look at church history, God has always allowed tribulations to test his people and his church. Generations upon generations of Christians have gone through trials and tribulations, and we are no more special than the saints who trod before us. We are no more privileged than those who had to die for their faith. The church never had, in fact, any greater witnesses, martyrion in the Greek, where we get the word martyr from, than those who were victorious in the end, in the midst of great trials and persecutions. That's why Jesus said, but the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. He was not talking to unbelievers at that moment who would ultimately miss the rapture. He was talking to his elect. That's people like you and me. He taught us to endure with his strength and to be ready for his return. Yes, the early church experienced terrible tribulation. But even that terrible Roman persecution was not the final great tribulation. How do we know this? Well, because Christ did not return immediately after those days. So there has yet to come a great tribulation of which Christ taught and spoke. And yet in all of this, there is Jesus' promise that his saints will be protected and ultimately delivered. Now, immediately after those days, 
not years later, Jesus said, the signs in heaven will appear and he will return. Paul said, and those of us who remain until the coming of the Lord will be caught up to be with the Lord forever. We shall all be raptured if we are Christ's and we are alive when he returns. Therein is our real comfort and hope to be reunited with Christ and all those who have gone before us. Comfort one another, Paul said, with these words. Christ is coming again with great power and glory. And that will not be a story of empty cars and people vanishing while the heathen world continues in misery, a mystery of what happened to all these people. It will be the story of Jesus the Christ touching down on the Mount of Olives to establish his long-awaited kingdom of righteousness and love, as Isaiah also prophesied and pictured in his words. And that singular event to which all creation moves will be initiated with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. May we all be ready. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, prepare us now for your return. May we know that whatever trials or tribulations we must endure, we, we have you to protect us, to deliver us, even unto your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would be with us and help us to walk as Christians ought to walk, to not compromise our belief in you or the way that Jesus taught us to live. And we look forward to that day when we shall all be reunited with those who have gone before us around your throne of mercy and grace at the great marriage supper of the Lamb. In Jesus we pray. Amen.